Good morning, everybody. This is uh, Carl Griffith from Graybar. I'm the Director of Emerging Technologies at Graybar. And uh, data centers is one of the things that I really enjoy. And we'd like to welcome you to our, our G2 Talk webinar series today, uh, where we're going to have a data center discussion. Today we're going to talk about migrating from 10 gig to 100 gig uh, inside the data center. And uh, we're looking forward to this uh, discussion. Before we get going, I'd like to have a little conversation about Graybar. Uh, for those of you online that don't know about Graybar, uh, we're a distributor. And our, and our mission statement, so to speak, is on the screen there. We, Graybar helps our customers power, network, and secure their facilities with speed, intelligent, and efficiency. And today that facility is a data center, and we're right on target talking about speed and intelligence inside the data center. Uh, if you're one of the first 50 people that logged on to this uh, uh, webinar today, this G2 Talk webinar, uh, you'll receive an uh, email a little later today or early tomorrow for a cup of coffee from a large coffee chain in the United States. And you can take that email and exchange it uh, for coffee. And uh, we're glad to offer that to you. Enjoy. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is, is that all of our G2 Talk webinars are archived and they're available to you on graybar.com. So if you go to graybar.com and see the G2 Talk uh, logo, you can click on that and follow the uh, path to the archive. And you can see all the presentations we've done in the past, and you'll be able to review them. And you'll also be able to download the white papers that are associated with them. Um, so that's a good way to, uh, to stay connected. We want our uh, session today to be interactive. Uh, therefore, we're going to offer a Q&A. So at the end of our presentation today, um, well, we'll have that Q&A session, which will happen in about 30 minutes. Uh, what will happen then is uh, if you would like to enter a question on the bottom of your screen, well, you'll see a little button there for QA. And if you'll click on that, a little window should open up or a, a dialog box will open up and you can type your question in there. And we'll see your question at this end. And at the end of our presentation today, we'll respond to those questions and we'll start our Q&A. So I don't want to hold things up, so I'd like to get things going, and I'd like to introduce to you our speaker today, who's Cam Patel. And Cam is a uh, business line manager uh, in the enterprise data center space at TE. Uh, I've met uh, Cam many times. He's been involved with uh, TE for 22 years. He's been a TE employee. And the last seven years of, uh, of Cam's career has been in the data center space. He has uh, several patents. Uh, and uh, we're just glad to have him on board with us as our speaker today. So without holding things up, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Cam. Thank you very much, Cam. Thank you, Carl. <clears throat> good morning and good afternoon, everybody. I want to thank you in advance for spending the next 20 to 30 minutes on our topic here. We're certainly going to be covering 10, 40, and 100 gigabit Ethernet as it relates to your data center or any place where you may choose to use it. Uh, one of the things that uh, I will say here is that obviously fiber channel becomes a large play in the data center, and all of the topics that we're talking about today apply to, to fiber channel also. So as I travel around the country and I meet many of you, uh, I always get asked the question, where is all the speed going? Who needs all this bandwidth? And if you look at the list of items that I've put on the slide here, and the IEEE was kind enough to provide these uh, these applications for me, what, what you'll find is data center certainly is one of the places that it goes, but it's it's larger than that, right? As we look at data centers, many of us are converting our edge devices, primarily our servers, from 1 gig to 10 gig. Many of us are starting to use blade servers. So there's lots of things and lots of applications where this could, uh, where this comes into play. As we look at this next slide, I've put together uh, what it looks like today. And when, when you look at the standard, the way it was ratified, and it's been ratified for a few years now, what you'll find is that they took into account all the mediums. So you, as you look at the standard, you'll see on the left that there's copper, and primarily that applies to direct attach style cables, which many of us use as it relates to top of rack type applications where we connect simply from the switch down to the server. As you move further to the right, what you'll see is that they've taken into account multi-mode and they've also taken into account single mode. 
So that usually lends itself to the question, why not single mode? And we'll cover that topic off as we get into this presentation. The other thing that we traditionally get asked, or I traditionally get asked, is when is this transition coming? Well, as it relates to 10 gig, as I mentioned earlier, that transitioning is occurring today. Many of us have these edge devices hooked at 1 gig, and we typically have 4 to 6 ports of 1 gig running into that. But as we start to add virtualization to our data center, processors are much faster today. They're capable of doing more. So what we do is we virtualize these and put many virtual servers onto a physical server. Sometimes we want to move those virtual servers from one physical server location to another. Uh, some of us use the term vMotion if you use VMware as your virtualization, and that takes a lot of bandwidth. So 10 gigs starts to make sense as it relates to that. Also, as we deploy Blade servers, uh, typically if we're running those servers at 10 gig, we're going to want an I.O. or an aggregation point that's much higher than that. Today, 40 gig is that choice of medium simply because of cost. I know some of us are really waiting for 100 gig, and we'll get into some of the cost proposition. But 40 makes a lot of sense. Uh, a lot of us have been using link aggregation where we take four 10 gig channels and tie them together. That happens to be an expensive medium. As electronics come out, it's much more effective to switch to that 40 gig medium here already. And as you can see here, what you'll notice is that these speeds are increasing you know, pretty much year over year. And what we'll see is today, 10 gig happens to be the crossing point on servers. As we look out to 2016, that really is the point where 40 gig will start to apply to the blade servers or to the servers themselves. And at that same point, what you're seeing is that 100 gig will be required in the core or the aggregation layer. And that makes sense because we're always looking for that uptick in bandwidth as it relates to our aggregation devices. As it relates to cost, should I be considering single mode fiber? Absolutely. Uh, we'll talk about reasons why, and they primarily have to do with distance, and we'll cover that off here in a minute. But as it relates to this, this slide, oh, it's a little deceptive, and let, let me fill you in. It looks like the cost of a 10 gig single mode and multi mode are the same. They're not. Uh, actually, the multi-mode port is about 30 to 40 percent cheaper. But what Cisco has done here is they've taken into account what the baseline price for 10 gig is, and then they take into account what the cost difference is for a 40 and 100 gig. And what you'll see on the left is uh, what you'll see on the left is 100 gig is just about 10 times the cost of a 10 gig port, which is something that we'd expect. But if you look to the right in single mode, it's it's a multiple factor, right? It, it increases much more. And what that's simply saying is it's easier to take lanes of traffic and use parallel optics as opposed to using wave division multiplexing, which actually adds a cost factor that's much greater than using these lanes of traffic. So many of us will be using multi-mode as it relates to our our data centers, what you'll find is single mode will be needed for distance. And if we look at what actually is required when we run 40 or 100 gig over multi-mode, certain things happen. The first thing is that we're used to a, a transmit and a receive path. Usually we're used to some form of duplex connector. As it relates to data center, and we'll cover this off in a little bit also, LC happens to be that connector of choice. As we head towards 40 and 100 gig, we're actually going to use multi-mode uh, MPO connectors, either 12 or 24. Today we're going to talk about the value proposition of 24, and we'll cover off soon why 24 makes sense. But instead of using these as the trunking connectors, which usually connect to the back of cassettes and then split out to LCs, we're actually going to use these as the patch cords that connect the data at those distances. Now, as it relates to distances, OM3, by virtue, we're used to using this as a 300 meter medium for 10 gig. It actually reduces the distance uh, to 100 meters. OM4, which traditionally supports, depending on who you talk to, 400 or 550 meters, is now relegated to 150 meters. Now this simply, it, it has to do with 
with the quality of lasers that are being used. It's not that they're using cheap lasers, they're using cheaper lasers, and that keeps the the cost factor from multiplying. It gets you to that nice 4x and 10x cost proposition that we saw earlier. What uh, is coming out pretty soon in the future here is the extended range of that, which gets you again to the 300 and the 400 meters, and that may address some of the issues and concerns that we're seeing with this drop in distance. The other thing that really starts to matter is there's a reduced loss budget. As it relates to 10 gig, today there's a link loss budget of 2.6 dB. That allows us to have nice cross connects and all of those things that are there that we're used to in data centers. It makes sense to do that. As it relates to the loss budget for 40 and 100 gig, what we're seeing is 1.9 dB at the uh, 1.9 dB at the OM3 loss and 1.5 at the OM4. So it sounds, it seems like the loss budget matters a lot here. Now, if you're familiar with MPO connectors, obviously there's multiple fibers. It's a difficult connector to polish and to mate up properly. So it behooves you to choose a good source of connectors here. Now. I wanted to show you a slide here. It's a little on the geeky side, but what we're looking at is an eye pattern for a transmission of 10 gig. And what we're looking at on the top is what the signal looks like coming directly out of a transceiver. Then on the slide on the bottom, what we've done is we've put together six cassettes and just about 296 meters of trunk that goes between those six cassettes to show you what a good polish and what can happen to the signal. And what you're seeing there is the signal looks almost identical, pretty much identical. And what you're seeing is because of the low loss characteristics of the product and the polish quality that's on those connectors, you're getting good transmission all the way through. So as you're selecting your vendors, uh, watch out for that. As it relates to what kind of connectors do I use, I wanted to throw this up because there are some subtle differences between 40 and 100. So what you'll see at 10 gig, this is what most of us are used to today. We're using an LC duplex type connector where you've taken two connectors and you've put them together. Obviously one to transmit, one to receive. As it relates to 40 gig, what you're seeing there is a 12 fiber MPO connection. And what you'll see is on the left, I've highlighted four of the fibers in red, and on, on the right, you'll see four are highlighted in green, and there's four in the middle. The reason for this is the four on the left are actually used for transmission, the four on the right are used for reception, and what we're not doing is using those four fibers in the middle. And that'll come into play as we talk about 24 fiber trunking in, in, in a, a second here. As it relates to 100 gig, certainly you could use two connectors and combine them together. But most of the electronics that we've seen out in the marketplace, and we do manufacture some of these electronics ourselves, actually uses a 24 fiber connector. And what you're seeing there is on the top, you have 10 red fibers lit up, and on the bottom you have 10 green fibers lit up. Obviously the top is for transmission and the bottom is for reception. So what you'll see is we're actually using 20 fibers, 10 to transmit, 10 to receive as it relates to 10 gig lasers. Okay, so why would I select 24 fiber uh, connectors to do that? Obviously you saw one of the reasons just ahead. What we're looking at here are a few good reasons to do that. One, it guarantees support for three generations of active equipment. You know, typically active equipment has a life cycle of three years. Many of us lease the equipment and then we get new equipment in three years. Some of us may push it for four. But as speeds and feeds continue to increase, obviously this active equipment has to be upgraded. And so there's very few guarantees in life, but by using a 24 fiber connector, we are able to assure you that regardless of the way the standard comes through, 10, 40, and 100 will be uh, utilized within your backbone cabling that you put place. Second is it reduces congestion. As you look at the 24 fiber cables and as you look at 12 fiber cables, cables have gotten a lot smaller, right? There's flat cables, there's round cables. Obviously there's a preference towards round and at TE that's what we promote. What you'll see is our 12 fiber cables are three millimeters in diameter 
And our 24 fiber cables are actually just larger. They're 3.8 millimeters in diameter. So if you take into fact that you are only able to uh, send or receive one 40 gig transmission over a 12 fiber cable, you're actually needing three cables to run three circuits, whereas you'll be able to run uh, three circuits off of one 24 fiber cable. So you can see it's a multiplicative factor that occurs there. The other thing is, you know, as we deploy infrastructure out there, none of us like to waste money. And so what we're doing here is finding a way or giving you a way to recoup 33% of your investment. You've got all those fibers in there. We might as well use it. Uh, some of us joke there's no fiber left behind or whatnot. But essentially, you're not losing any of those fibers there. The next step is it increases densities in fiber panels. Uh, as it relates to the core switches, they're starting to get quite large in height. Uh, many of them are in the 20 to 21 rack unit. Uh, to get two of these in there is a chore. And if you've got large fiber panels, there's no way that you'd get two of these in there. And as we all know, the most expensive thing in a data center is the space itself, right? So what this does is this allows you to put smaller patch panels, utilize hydro cables to connect to those switches, and it gives you much better density. And the other thing is, is that it increases efficiencies, right? The last thing that we want to do or tell one of our clients is, hey, I know you have this application you want to run, but it's going to take me three or four weeks to get the infrastructure in place. Simply what you're doing here is you're either replacing patch cords or you're replacing cassettes, and I'll show you a slide of our product set here in a minute. And that allows you to make the transition from 10 to 40 to 100, and it doesn't really require a forklift upgrade to do it. None of us wake up and say, hey, today's 40 gig day and transition all of our circuits over. This allows you to do it in a managed fashion. So what do we see coming? Well, today I showed you what a 10 gig channel looks like, and you'll see that in the first three. So essentially, if you're using a 24 fiber backbone cabling, you're able to actually get 12 10 gig circuits out of that, which is a pretty good proposition. You're not losing any fibers. You're utilizing all of your fibers there. When you decide to do the upgrade to 40, you simply change a cassette or a hydro cable depending on the infrastructure that you've used and you'll actually be able to get three 40 gig channels out of this remember when we said 12 gives you one well this 24 actually gives you three so you've got a 33 percent bonus now by utilizing a 24 fiber infrastructure it allows you to easily transition from 10 to 40 you can do it uh, in a contained manner uh, as we talked about, this doesn't require a forklift upgrade. You can transition one of the cassettes, maintain 10 gig on the other cassettes you may have within the panel, so it allows you to upgrade slowly. If you need 100 gig today, the only way to do it is with the 24 fiber connector, so it assures that you'll be able to do that. Now, I'd be remiss to tell you that it's always going to be 10 gig channels. Uh, we at TE have already announced some product sets at the OFC that actually use 25 gig lanes of traffic. And if you do that, what you'll see is the picture marries up exactly with what 40 gig looks like. So by the time most of us are ready to deploy 100 gig, we'll probably be at that scenario already. And so the infrastructure that you put in for 40 gig today will easily transition to the 100 gig without even having to make any changes. So there's even a bonus factor there. As it relates to the product set, and what I was trying to show you here earlier, and what this slide depicts is, you'll see down the center, there's always a 24 fiber trunk, right? Now, obviously, as you expand and upgrade, there may be times where you need to uh, deploy more fibers, but there is one constant in this. It's that 24 fiber backbone that exists there. And what you're seeing on the top is most of us do this today with 12 fibers, is we utilize a cassette to connect those. And there's LC patch cords that come off the sides. And what you're seeing there is for each trunk, you're getting 12 two fiber LC patch cords, just as you would expect. On the second row there, where it says 40 gig, what you'll notice is that trunk stays in place. Now, instead of 12 circuits, I'm gonna have three. 
But typically when we're doing that kind of upgrade, it's not a one-for-one. -one. We've switched to blade servers or something like that. So you may need more 24 fiber trunks, but it allows you to simply transition right away, changing that cassette. Uh, it allows you to plug a 24 fiber cable in and come out with three MPO type connectors off of there to hook your 40 gig equipment. And then as we look at the bottom today, uh, so that is today for 40 gig. If the 25 gig lasers come along, you would leave that hardware in place for the 40 gig and that gets you to the 100 gig also. If we're looking today at 100 gig or if we're looking at high density applications, what you'll see on the bottom is you'll see they're simply MPO adapters. Uh, one of the things to be careful with here is pinned versus non-pinned and fiber counts. The 12 fiber connectors look exactly the same as the 24, so we've taken measures to put red boots and all of those things to, to identify 24 fiber cables. But the biggest mistake that we see folks making on this is pinned versus non-pinned. And what we've done is we've taken that care of that as it relates to our 40 and 10 gig products. Essentially, everything within our products is pinned that allows you to put a non-pinned patch cord in the connection between the piece of equipment that you're running and the uh, TE connectivity product that it would connect to. The reason we do that is there's always damage between pinned and non-pinned. It's usually the non-pinned that gets damaged. This way you're not ruining a cassette or part of your infrastructure. If you do remate these and you find that there's an insertion loss issue, this allows you to simply switch patch cords. It's a much more responsible way to upgrade. Hopefully by this point I've sold you on the virtue of 24 and all of the benefits that it would offer you. So at this point, what's probably running through your mind is, well, how much more does this cost, right? And I wanted to share this next slide. It's a snippet that I've taken from a bill of materials that we've been working. And what I've done here is actually take the worst case scenario. And what I mean by that is these are 10 gig circuits that we're trying to uh, hook up. That means that it's a one for one fiber feed. This number looks actually a lot better as you transition towards 40 gig because you've got the multiplicative factor that occurs of losing every third trunk cable. But what you're seeing here is a day one deployment cost, and this is really what all of us are worried about, right? Certainly there's day two costs that occur, but really we're worried about the cost of the data center on day one. How much is it gonna cost to build? And on this design, it's, it's about an $838,000 bill as you look at a 12 fiber trunk. To go one for one, what you're finding is for 24 fiber construction, the price actually drops to 772,000. There's actually a $65,000 savings day one, which roughly equates to about 8%. What this means is not only are we getting a benefit of having the the guarantee of being able to run whatever application comes along in the next five to 10 years. We're also getting a cost savings to do that. You might be asking yourself, why does this cost less? Well, if you think about it, right, it makes a lot of sense. In order to run three 40 gig circuits over a 12 fiber construction, you actually have six connectors. As it relates to a 24 fiber construction, you've got the two between the trunks, and that reduces our or it increases our throughput through our factories, and it also increases our efficiency to be able to do these things. So we like to pass those savings on to you as a consumer. So what you're seeing is guarantees for three active generations of equipment, which takes care of my needs for the next five to 10 years. What you're seeing is a day one cost reduction, which makes a lot of sense, right? That's easy to justify. And what you're seeing is the other costs going down. Obviously, you've got one cable to pull instead of three. So in terms of installation, that makes it a lot easier. What we're looking at is reduced cost for containment. We're looking at increased densities within our patch panels. So there's tons of benefits that are associated with that. With that, I'm going to hand it back over to Carl so that we can begin our question and answer session. Thank you very much, Cam. And we do have some questions here. Uh, be prepared. We may ask you to go back in your presentation just a little bit. Uh, but Marvin asked a good question, and I wanted to give it to you. Maybe we can go into a little more detail here. 
Um, the question is, is can you explain how you get a 3 by 12 fiber patch cable off of a 24 fiber trunk? Could you kind of go over that again? Sure. And let me go to the slide so that we see it. So essentially, Marvin's right, right? 3 by 12 is 36, and I've got a 24 fiber trunk. The reason that that's stated as 3 by 12 is rather than having specialized patch cords, which then run into inventory issues and all of those things, what we're doing is for that last patch connection, we just use a standard 12 fiber cable to, to represent that. So each one of those 12 fibers actually only uses eight fibers, but for that last patch, it allows you to make that connection simply. Okay, so the the actual patch connection only requires eight fibers, not 12. Correct. Three times eight is 24. And right. so it's really not... It's really not magic here. It's just taking advantage of the unused fiber, correct? Correct. All right. Great. And then uh, Tony asked a question here. Can a pinned MTP be connected to a pinned MTP, or does it have to be connected to a pin to a non-pinned? The actual connection needs to be a pin to a non-pinned. That's actually the alignment mechanism for that connector. The adapter is just a piece of plastic that holds those housings together. Unfortunately, a pinned MTP to a pinned MTP connection can occur. Transmission won't occur, though, because now what you have is ferrules that aren't mated together, and you'll have dispersion. So you'll see all kinds of weird readings, and you'll see light coming from one fiber into the other. So it does have to be a pin to non-pin connection for this to work effectively. Okay, so that's a gotcha. We need to pay attention to this pin to non-pin is the correct method, not pin to pin. Correct. And what you'll start to see, we're, we're, we'll either use icons to let you know if it's pinned or non-pinned, or a lot of times what we'll just do is silk screen right on the cassette so that you'll be able to see whether there's a pinned connection and you need a non-pinned connection. So we're trying to make it easy for everybody to uh, be able to utilize this. Right. I wanted to remind everybody, if you have a question, all you need to do is type it in the dialog box. If you don't see it on your screen, there's a little button at the bottom of your screen that you can pet, uh, push, and that Q&A dialog box will open up. Another question is, is uh, uh, when do you think we're going to see 40 and 100 gig applications? I mean, are we overbuilding too early here, or is there some 40 and 100 gig coming on the horizon, Cam? Well... I mean, as it relates to 40, I think we're already starting to see it, right? And where we really see it is in the aggregation spots. So what we're looking at is the edge is certainly moving up to 10 gig, right? As it relates to servers, most of the traffic is east-west, and meaning we're using multiple servers to process an application today. When you send in a search to a, your uh, provider, it does work across multiple servers and then it connects to your storage to get you the information. But what we're seeing is because that is going up to 10 gig, a lot of us have already been utilizing 40 gig for a while. We simply did it with link aggregation. It was an expensive way to do it, but it was the only way to really get 10 gig out to the edge, which people wanted. Now with 40 gig equipment that's out there, a lot of us have already started transitioning. And what you'll find is, even though the study said that there's actually a uh, four times increase to get to, to 40 gig, it's, it's not that high. It's actually three point something. So what some of us are already trying to do is increase how much traffic we can get over our core switches. After all, it's the core switches that are, that are expensive. So some of us are doing it in the reverse. We're already buying 40 gig circuits for our core switches. And then we're taking into fact that there's parallel circuits and splitting them out to 10 gig. So I would say 10 and 40 are occurring today. Uh, we do have certain customers that are video intensive that are already looking at the 100 gig. Or we see that service providers such as uh, co-location facilities are also looking for 100 gig to connect there. But uh, I'd say 100 is probably three to four years out mainstream. But 10 and 40 are here today. 
Michael has a question that goes back to this MPO interface, and I'm going to read, read it to you, Cam, exactly the way it's been given to me. I don't quite understand it, so we'll see if maybe you understand it. He says, rolling, rolling, R-O-L-L-I-N-G, rolling the MPO or not is the question. And then he made a comment, transmit to receive. Um, can you decipher what Michael's getting at there? I do. So as it, as it relates to polarity, there's essentially three types of polarity that you can have within your trunks. And so there's a method A, a method B, and a method C. Uh, we have elected to use method A. And the reason is, is when you use single mode, we use angled single mode connectors. So you have to have that key up, key down transmission. What we're doing to make this easier is we actually have two different types of cassettes where, where things need to occur. And as it relates to 24 fiber, it gets even more complex because you have rows that flip. You have row one and row two. Those do flip within the key up, key down. So what we've tried to do is make a simple day two or end user experience where you need the same style of patch cord to go out there. And so as long as you're using our cassettes, you'll always need a method A trunk and you'll always need a method A patch cord. So we've taken the guesswork out of it uh, and we've taken the pin, non-pin situation out of it too. So I hope that answers your question. The, uh, uh, Bob uh, wanted to know if the presentation today is being recorded and I want to do a sure Bob that it is. You can go to graybar.com, hit, hit the G2 Talk uh, logo on the home page and just follow the uh, clicks to the archive and you can pick up this presentation and you can also pick up the uh, uh, the white paper there so you'll be able to look at it later. Um, there's another question about uh, 24 fiber trunks. Do they typically come pinned or non-pinned? The trunks are always non-pinned and the reason is as you're pulling it through conduit or you're pulling it through your raceway we don't want you to damage the pins, right? So if you've got, technically you should have the cover on it. We put covers on everything. But the trunks are always non-pinned. It's always the cassettes in the rear that have a, a, a pin. So traditional rule is anything that you connect to the back of the patch panel needs to be a non-pinned connector. Anything that you connect to the front typically required a pin to made up with that trunk. Now we've changed that a little bit. And the reason we changed it is the equipment itself is going to have a pinned connector. So if you look at your transceiver. So what we wanted to do is use a non-pin to non-pin patch cord. And the reason for that is what I told you earlier, right? It's the pinned connector that damages the non-pinned connector. And by doing that, what it really does is it allows you to now have a patch cord that can get damaged. And that's easy to change but it doesn't damage the switch port and it doesn't damage the, uh, the, the fiber cassette that you may have. Now, that being said, if, if you're using equipment that doesn't, then you have to have a patch cord that has pins on one side and no pins on the other. That's why we've elected to, to make that easy so that it's just a simple non-pin to non-pin patch cord. Great, thank you for the explanation, Cam. Nicole would like to know on your last slide where you were talking about the costs. Yes. Uh, is the distance correct? There was a reference to 10 meters on that last slide. Right. So, you, you know, there was some assumptions, and this was, was built out for a special uh, client application. And what they were doing with that 10-meter array cable is they're actually using a cross-connect uh, scenario. They wanted to get two core switches within a cabinet. And in this case, they were using a, a very large core switch. So what they're doing is they're taking those array cables and they go to the cross connect. So essentially, the LC connectors would plug directly into the core switch. And then this array cable actually went to the back of the cassette for the first cross connect. So they were using it as representation cables. So that 10 meter is correct. And then as you look at their distribution where they were going out to zone boxes, they've, they've centered their data center fairly well so that 40 meters on average was the trunk. So this, this allowed us to wrap up a quick bill of material. Thanks for the ex, ex, uh, explanation, Cam. Um, 
Uh, Charlie uh, is one of your friends on IEEE, and he asked you this question, Cam. If we, IEEE, are uh, mid-grading over to four lanes of 25G, this will allow you to stay within a 12-fiber footprint. Doesn't this right. render the 24-fiber solution obsolete? No, it, it doesn't, and the reason is, it's not just application-based, right? So if we look at this slide, if you were to use a 12-fiber connection, if you were to use a 12-fiber connection, what will happen is you'll get one circuit connection. By using a 24-fiber trunking cable and a cassette, you're actually able to get three connections out of there. So you still have a 33% recoup of the fiber and a reduction in cost and the 8% actually gets to a better cost proposition. We're probably looking at more to 12 to 15% in the calculations that we've done and the bill of materials that we've run through with customers. So it's a no loss proposition, right? If you need 100 gig today and it's 10 gig lanes, then you're guaranteed to be able to use it. Should it transition to 25 gig, then you're still getting a 3x factor or you're getting one extra circuit than you would out of a or two extra circuits out of a 24 than you would a 12. Okay, good. Sarah wants to know if uh, 12 fiber and 24 fiber patch cords come pigtailed so they can be spliced. Uh, that's certainly one of the ways to do it. Uh, we've got large customers that love to do it that way. Uh, obviously, it's one splice versus 12, so those kinds of products are available. Uh, we have customers that don't know their exact lengths or don't want to damage anything, so they'll buy a single-ended and then splice on a uh, MPO connection. Okay. Well, uh, I don't see any more questions coming in. If you have one, please send it. I'm going to ask one more, and then we'll see if it stimulates any more thought. Cam, uh, we talked an awful lot about the advantages of... 24 fiber. Uh, are there disadvantages for 24 fiber that we need to note? Yeah, I mean, I would say the single largest disadvantage possibly is when you look at your 10 gig circuits, right? And the reason that I say this is when you have a 12 connector connection that you're using for trunking, you've already got six circuits tied up to that single cable. Now, as you move to 24, certainly you've got 12. So the disadvantage would be if anything happened to that cable, now we've got dual redundancy and all those things to take care of that, but you would actually be losing 12 circuits as opposed to six. Everything else I think matches up and it, it does fairly well. Uh, the losses, all those things are there. So essentially that would be the biggest detractor for 24 fiber. Christina has a question about uh, field terminated MPOs. We know there's been a couple of those introduced on the market. Do you have any comments at all about field terminated MPOs, Cam? Uh, I don't. I mean, from what I've seen, the loss characteristic on those connections are usually between 0.5 and 0.75. So the only thing that I would caution you is fiber is very good and cabling is very good today, so there's almost zero loss through that cable at the distances that we're talking about, or maybe dot one, dot two. But if you've got a field terminable connector that adds or introduces 0.5 or 0.75 dB of loss. I'll go back to the slide that showed the loss characteristics, right? And what you're seeing is you're seeing a tightening of that budget. So if you've got two connectors that you're putting on, there's a dB of loss that only gives you a safety margin of 0.5 at, at longer distances. So they're good products. I think they're good for repair. Uh, I don't know if I would build my entire data center on that based on the reduced loss budget that's coming along with these things. Well, it does run you close to it, and you're getting, uh, you run out of loss budget. It'd definitely be a problem there. But I'm sure the technology will continue to uh, improve. Of course, we at Graybar will continue to keep an eye on that, and uh, if we see some improvements in uh, field terminated MPO connectors, we'll be sure to let everybody know for sure. Cam, we want to thank you for your time you spent with us today. It's been absolutely outstanding. Uh, the questions were, uh, were just great. 
If we didn't get to your question today, uh, right now online, we'll be sure to answer it uh, via email. All of uh, the questions are being recorded. If you're one of the first 50 people to be online with us today, you're going to get a cup of coffee. Congratulations. If anybody wants to review our uh, presentation, our G2 talk uh, uh, discussion today about migrating from 10 to 100 gig in the data center, uh, that's available to you uh, at graybar.com. Just click on the G2 talk logo. We thank you for your time today, and we'll look forward to hooking up with you again next month. Have a great day.